I'm going to kind of let Cody just take it and run for the most part. But really, I think the goal is just to have a conversation, get to know each other, share a little bit about our backgrounds. And if you're looking to get into ethical hacking, um, hopefully our stories might help you in some way or another. Yeah. And, you know, for for my viewers, um, they, they may not be um, familiar with uh, the like the, the small hacker YouTuber community. So um, for, for those that don't know you, tell us a little about yourself, Harley. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I go by infinite logins online at the moment. Um, but I'm a pin tester, uh, an ethical hacker, I love to, to kind of, I'm just really passionate about cybersecurity and information security kind of as a whole. Um, I am newer to the field, I just started professionally working in pin testing within the last six months. Um, but I've always kind of dabbled in, in different things. I did my first, I guess, real security assessment, um, probably like six years ago when I was going through, um, I, I've got an associate's degree. So when I was going through school, uh, I was able to convince my gym to let me do like a wireless assessment on their network. So that was technically like my first pin test, but I mean, I've been working as a sysadmin type role, uh, for about four years before moving into security. So now I'm doing this like weird thing where I talk on a camera and record my screen and put it on YouTube. Um, but like my real goal behind that is to to be just transparent. It, it's a learning process for me. So I like to make videos that talk about different hacking tools, right? And different processes or methodologies. And it just helps me learn them. And then I'll put it out there in case someone else is looking to learn too. You know, I, I love to teach and give back where I can. So I do YouTube, I've got my own blog. Um, I've got a, a small little Discord community where we do and talk about bug bounties because I'm trying to get better in that space. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. And, um, you know, I, I'm also relatively new to the field. I, um, at least like getting in, like pen testing, red teaming sort of stuff. I just started, um, back in February of this year. So totally understand it. Uh, it can be both easy and difficult at the same time getting into the field. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, I'm really excited to talk with someone that still has like that that experience fresh in their mind so, um, I, I think a lot of people will really appreciate hearing your journey and how you ended up in the field of penetration testing because let's be honest it's a really cool job yeah i mean it's it's definitely like the coolest job i know when i was going through school and i think a lot of students that are studying cybersecurity, um pen testing is such a small niche thing like in the world of cybersecurity, it's not all that there is um, at all. And but when you go through school, you know, especially if, if your degree program has like a CEH path, a certified ethical hacker course or something like that, um, it makes it really, really convincing for everyone to think like, oh, I've got to be a hacker if I want to do cybersecurity, or it's like the sexy thing to do. Like everyone like wants to be a pin tester, um, and so. So yeah, I mean, I think it's really cool because if you are in that position, I, I feel like I know when I was going through school, that's what I wanted to do. But a lot of people told me like, pin testing is not entry level, like you're not going to be able to do it, you know, and there, it's really competitive and there's not a lot of pin testers. And it was just like a lot of, a lot of negativity around like, you should go do something else. And I, I think that it's important for people that like know that that's what they want, that you can do it you know, and you can pull it off. It's going to take a ton of, it's going to take a ton of work, um, but you can do it, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like for, for those just starting to look at this field, you know, they'll, they'll hear penetration testing and they'll hear red teaming and they'll think, oh, well, that must be the same thing. But there, there's, there is a lot of overlap, but there, there are some, some very, very different like outcome objectives between the two. So um, for your day to day, or even even just like on, on any any engagement that you do, what's what's like, um, like a normal day on an engagement for you? So like a normal day in a in a pin test, um, you know, I've, I kind of specialize, I've been thrown into more network assessments than anything else. Um, and I think that personally, that's just because I come from more of like a sysadmin type background. So understanding active directory and understanding how internal networks work are kind of like my thing. Um, but in majority of the companies I've talked with and the majority of professionals that work in the field, like in 2020, the bread and butter for pen testing is web application security and, and pen testing web apps. Um, and 
I think a day in the life for most normal people would be a lot of web app testing. Um, so that would be things like the OWASP top 10, cross-site scripting, uh, C-Surf or S-Surf, right? Um, those type of common vulnerabilities that you'd see in a web application is going to probably be where you spend most of your time. But for me personally, I work pretty independent for the most part. Like my company says, hey, we've got this assessment. Here's your timeline. You know, here's the scope and go. <laughs> this is how you get connected and go. Um, and so from there, you know, I just, I get connected to my client's network. And as long as I stay within the scope and that timeline, I do my thing. And that's really about it. You know, it's a lot of, it's, pen testing is really tedious. So like, if you're new to hacking and, and it's not like the movies, right, where you're sitting there and, and you're typing on a keyboard a thousand, a thousand words per minute um, until you, you know, five seconds later, you're like, we're in. <laughs> it's, it's very tedious. You do a lot of scripts that run in the background or a lot of enumeration. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Is there like a, a particular piece of, of my day that you're looking for? Um, uh, I don't, I don't think so, but, um, I, I guess in, in like the, the overall goals with your engagements, would you, would you say that you're, you're kind of looking, looking at everything, trying to find every vulnerability that you possibly can as, as like a snapshot in time or is it, is yeah, it kind of so, fluid and kind of changes with the scope? It, it's really dependent on what the client's asking. Cause I work, I work in consulting, uh, which may be different than someone who is uh, an in-house pen tester, right? Where you're a part of an internal pen testing team and maybe you work with other people for the same company looking at that company's technology all the time. Uh, for what I do, I could be talking to, you know, one business today and another business tomorrow. And so it's just really important that we understand what the client's objectives are. And in some cases, they might just be looking to check a box. They're just like, do the assessment, tell us where you know our problems are, give us the report, and, and we'll move on. But in other cases, there'll be a, a client that really wants us to take like a certain scenario where they're like, look, so we're really concerned about this particular server, or we're really concerned about this, right? Exfiltration of data or whatever the case is. And so you keeping that in mind, you might approach your, your pen test a little bit differently based on what their needs are. Um, but I think as a pen test as a whole, you're typically looking at all the technology and you're finding vulnerabilities that might exist, putting them in a report and sending them off where I think you you get a little bit more like, or, uh, I guess like objective oriented is more in like a red team engagement, um, where you might be looking to fly under the radar. Uh, no one in the company knows you're coming. You're not trying to be so noisy because with a pen test, I'm purposely noisy. Like, you know, I'm, I'm scanning like crazy. Um, and I'm, if, if I hit antivirus and my malware gets picked up or a tool gets blocked, I'm just more annoyed than anything else. I'm like, okay, now I got to find another way to get that malware on the system. And I'm not really concerned with like, oh man, I just probably set off an alert. Right, because they know I'm there in a pen test. They put me there on purpose. In a red team engagement, you might be flying under the radar. And part of the purpose is to test, okay, let's let's simulate a real attacker and how they would be trying to stay on the network and be as silent as possible and try to pivot around. Um, and then if you get caught, that's that's when incident response and then the blue team kicks in. And then they and they use that opportunity to test their blue team and see, okay, well, how would our team handle this? So I do think that there's a lot of miscommunication or everyone has their own opinion on what a red team is in the community, but that's kind of how I would describe the difference between the two. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily like the same way for pen testing as it is for what I do. So it, there, like I said before, there is a lot of overlap. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go through a lot of the same steps. Um, so the, one of the, one of probably the most surprising aspects of it is that, um, our engagements actually kind of start before they officially start. So, um, you know, not in the sense that we're like, trying to break into stuff before the engagement starts like that, that is, that is a no go. That's an easy way to get fired. But, yeah. um, but like we, we will do, um, you know, some OSINT will, will prepare beacons and stuff to, to bypass antivirus and, you know, make sure that all of our infrastructure is set up before we go into an engagement and make sure that, you know, if, if, and when we find something, we're going to be ready to go. And so yeah. like, um, you know, we'll, we'll, 
browse job postings, you know, see if, if there's any like specific piece of technology that, that the company is looking for that could be applied to, to the scope of our engagement. Like there, there, there is a substantial amount of preparation that goes into it. For sure. But um, yeah. ultimately the, the outcome is that we're in a sense we're, we're, we're kind of like the yin to the blue team's yin. Like we, yeah. we are, we are there to make them better. But on the same note, like we don't have as many rules as regular pen testers do. So like we, we show up whenever we feel like it, like um, our engagements are as long as, you know, we feel that they need to go on. And um, even, even with the scope, um, sometime like most most of the time we'll 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 stick to it like pretty religiously but um you know if, if there's times where we feel that it's appropriate for for the scope to change through like midway through the engagement um you know we'll we'll propose that to what's called the white cell and the white cell is kind of like um kind of like the game masters you know making sure that everybody plays by the rules and you know one side doesn't have an unfair advantage over the other so it, it's they're very fluid and they, they, they can change on a whim. Nice. And and that's and that's because you're part of like the in house side of, of pin testing, right? Yeah, and and I that's interesting to hear, you know, because I don't see that perspective as, as an outside consultant. Um, typically for us, the scope is purposely put into place because of whatever objectives that, that company has, and there's not really wiggle room out of that. Um, so when we do, and that's a part of the thing that kind of sucks about like pin test consultant work is sometimes you might not find anything, but that wasn't because there's not anything there. Like that's just because the client underscoped the engagement. Um, for example, I was just on a web app assessment where I only had a very limited, I had one website to target, but all of the functionality, like the website was just there to produce like provide information about the company, um, any of the links to actually like log into your account and, and do stuff that we as web app pin testers would typically start poking around with, um, all of that functionality get, redirects you to a different domain and that domain's not in scope. <laughs> so, you know, I, I ended up writing out this report that says, yeah, you guys are in good shape. I couldn't find anything that was exploitable. Um, but it's not necessarily true because there's the actual core functionality that attackers would be looking for was outside of scope and we couldn't test it. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of interesting to hear, you know, the other side where it's like, I bet if I was internal, I could probably approach the game master and be like, look, I think we need to add this in scope because of this reason. And, and maybe we can give you a better picture of what your, what your threat model looks like, which is ultimately why we have jobs. Yeah. And so on, on the flip side, you know, we, we might come across something that would be like crazy awesome to, to put on a pen test report, but we, we might end up totally ignoring that because it, it doesn't fit in with, with the red team's objectives, you know? So like it, if, if we have a very clear objective to, you know, extract, see if we can extract some kind of information out of, out of like an embedded environment and we see, oh, well, this environment over here, that like, doors wide open we might ignore that entirely i mean like we'll, we'll we'll bring it up you know we'll we'll mention it afterward but we typically stay very focused to to the outcome yeah and i mean i think for i doubt that we've got companies in here that are watching but in the event that we do and and you're looking at this content because you're like hmm, i wonder how to hire a pin tester right what, what type of questions do i ask um let, let me just share, I can't share too much, obviously, but I can share a, a little bit of a story where we were on a social engineering engagement um, and it was by far the funnest engagement I have ever been on um, where basically everything was in scope when it comes to sh social engineering. So we were physically on site. Um, so we flew out there and everything. And then we also had the ability to do phishing and vishing. Um, and had they only allowed one piece, like if only on site was in scope and we couldn't call people or email people, we wouldn't have been successful. Or if we could only fish, we wouldn't have been successful. And same with vishing. But because they had all pieces in scope, we were able to physically go on site uh, and identify a password written on a sticky note, which then we were able to use to sign into an email account, um, which we could then send phishing emails out. Because from the outside, we tried to fish from basically externally outside the company and they had 
some security measures in place for their email. Really, really strong. Like none of our phishing emails made it through. I don't even think they got opened. Um, so that was really, really cool. But because we could go on site, we got an internal email compromise at that point. Phishing was a little bit more open. Um, but then likewise, there was a, a time where we needed to get inside the, a different building and we couldn't. Like they were like, no, like we can't let you in. We don't know why you're here. So we vished at that point, the, the security officer who um, we just pretended to be our boss of the company we were impersonating. And because we were able to, to impersonate and vish over the phone, uh, he gave us the green light. He's like, okay, if you come back tomorrow night, we'll let you in. <laughs> so it's like if any one of those pieces were not allowed or if they were under scoped, the, it wouldn't have been a successful like real picture of what their security posture is. Um, you know, we would have had to write, like, we couldn't fully compromise, but because those things were properly scoped, we could simulate what a real, real, like, bad actors would do um, if they were targeting that company like we were. So it was really cool. That was a lot of fun. And it shows the importance of scoping a, an engagement correctly. Yeah. And, you know, um, uh, like, for a lot of people, you know, the, they'll see, like, Hollywood movies and they'll see, like, oh, yeah. Lights are yeah. off. Some dude's wearing yeah. a balaclava, and you know, the, like the Matrix <laughs> is going on all of the screens. Right. Um, yeah, you know, it it is indeed very cool to to like imagine that is real life. But believe it or not, sometimes the cool pen test stories are a lot more interesting than what you might see in a movie. Do you have yeah? Do you have any any cool success stories that you can share? That that last one I shared is by far my most favorite. Um, by impersonating the company. That, that that client worked with, we got an escort. The security guards completely escorted us inside the server room, inside the CEO's office. Um, and this was a, a major, like they, they do multi, multiples, uh, like multi-billion dollar company as far as what they do each year. Um, so I don't even know what they'd be valued at, but it was, it was really cool. That's my favorite story to tell. Um, but then there's other times, honestly, a lot of engagements, they're not like, elite hacks you know what i mean like most of the time it's really stupid stuff like i got domain admin from uh plain text that was sitting in a log file um i've gotten domain admin and social security numbers from like file shares that were just globally accessible or nfs shares i i was able to get access to all of the the vmdk files for like the entire company on an open nfs share um, yeah, I had, I had access to like copy those and just re recreate their VMs in my own environment if I wanted to, um, you know, so it's just like really, really low hanging, stupid stuff that when you, when I worked with small to medium sized businesses, you kind of think like, okay, like they're small business, they don't have the funds and, or the knowledge behind like understanding how to secure this properly, but the enterprise guys got it figured out, you know, they're, they're good on that level. And it's been kind of eye-opening um, to to see that even the big guys, the people who have the budgets, they make really dumb mistakes. And it's not to trash on them. Um, you know, I think, I think honestly, most of it is people just don't know, you know? Yeah. Like a lot of people don't understand why signing in to a workstation as domain admin is, is a problem, you know? And to us hackers, we're like, okay, that's a problem. <laughs> Um, but a lot of IT admins don't understand that. So it's just an education process that I think is really important, but somehow, you know, and, and it's more than just user awareness training. Um, the IT guys need to be educated and on, on like best IT practices. So I hope more and more companies, I hope pin testing will become more affordable in the future. So that way more and more companies can actually either hire in-house pin testers or be able to afford more regular pin test of applications and networks that they produce. Cause I think right now, a lot of companies, especially the small size guys, like they just don't, they can't afford it. And so they just ignore it and they never get properly educated. Um, and then they get bit and we've got problems, <laughs> you know? I think one of, one of the biggest concerns, uh, at least in my opinion, um, that, that we really face today is that, um, you know, a lot of the bigger companies, they, they have budgets to, to hire people like you and they have budgets to, to have, you know, internal people like me, but a lot yeah. of small businesses don't. 
and oftentimes they're like one of the biggest victims of ransomware. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, very, very real. Um, do you do you see? Um, I guess a, any potential things that the the hacker community could do to, to kind of offshore that, or you know, maybe maybe even if it's just public awareness. Um, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, man, I do actually. I've got a lot of thoughts on that because um, I come from. I worked at an MSP for four years before I started pin testing, and so we just offered managed services, managed IT services to small businesses really were, I mean, the largest client we had was like 60 seats, you know, 60 workstations. So very small companies. Um, and we had companies as small as two people that we, we had that paid us every month. So I, I have like this connection, I think, because of just that time I spent with, with all these small businesses. And I think small business is important for the health of community, but also you need to support small businesses because, you know, it's hard to start a, a company, but you know, and, and so being able to support those guys is, in, is obviously important. Um, but I think as a hacker community, kind of what I mentioned is like being able to make pen testing affordable. And I don't know what the answer is because it's really hard to get into this field because of the amount of knowledge that you have to gain. You know, it, it's a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of studying. Um, and so eventually when you do develop the skills needed to be successful, you can demand a high wage and you can demand to be paid really well. Um, but I don't know. I feel like there's got to be communities that get together where we can find ways to make it more affordable for small businesses. And if that's just doing free security awareness training webinars on a regular basis um, or maybe even donating. I think if every pen tester were to take like one week out of their year uh, to go out and do a free assessment for a small business, I think that that would help because there there are hundreds of pen testers, you know, and, and obviously it's just going to make a small dent. Um, but doing those small like little donations is essentially what it is. Can I think a get get those companies more involved in the pen testing process so that way they know what to expect for next time. Um, but, but two, like maybe just that one pen test is enough to identify all the low hanging problems that they can go and fix. And that could, that could save that company down the road. Yeah. And, um, I, I think it's important that, you know, something at the very least, um, goes in a, in a direction because as it, as it currently stands, like people are just going to fall victim and, you know, nobody, nobody likes seeing anybody getting, you know, screwed over. But um, yeah, I think I think there's some avenues available out there for for small businesses. Like um, I know you can sign up on Bug Crowd and like maybe you don't have the resources for for like a full fledged bounty program. But I mean, um, you know, Bug Crowd will still work with small businesses and um, you know help them develop uh, like a points only program, and everybody benefits from that. You know, like yeah. e even even the people doing the the testing like they can get they can build up points. For, for their reputation and get invites to, to you know, more developed programs. For sure. So yeah. I think that, no. that might be one option. That is an option for sure. And um, I know that there's other resources. Like I was in, I, I live in Portland, Oregon, and there was a, uh, when I was going through school, the Small Business Development Center, which I'm pretty sure SBDC is their acronym, and, and I'm pretty sure they've got one in every state. Um, but basically it's, it's a government funded organization that is there to help provide resources for small businesses. And when I was going through school, they were, they had recently received a grant where they were looking to provide cybersecurity resources for small businesses that couldn't afford them. So I was involved in the early stages of coming up with an organization called Cyber Oregon, where that's what we did. We just tried to, you know, create assessment checklist people could do themselves or other security awareness training or links and articles and, and things like that, that if you're a small business owner and you needed help, you can go to this website and you can look at all of these resources available to you. Um, and that might be a, a thing, you know, if, if you run a small business or you know someone who does and they're struggling with cybersecurity and they don't have the money to, to keep, I guess, keep operations secure. Um, I would say look into to seeing if the SBDC near you has maybe some resources available and I'd reach out to them. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, 
you know, what, what's applicable to our lives, you know, as, as penetration testers and red teams, um, you know, it's, it, it is indeed always cool to hear about the, the success stories and, yeah. you know, helping, helping other people out. But, um, in some, sometimes failures can be like a really, really important lesson too. Um, do you have, so like one, one trend that's been going on in my channel is, um, burp spider. Right. Yep. Uh, I, I think you've heard a couple of the stories. Yep. Um, yep, yep, yep. Do you have, do you have any, any oops moments that, that you really took a lot of value away from? My, one of my first pin tests that I had ever been on, um, it was an internal network assessment and, um, I had Nessus run and it came back and it's like, oh, all these machines are, are vulnerable to Eternal Blue, right? So I was like, sweet, that's an easy win. Um, but they were, like, majority of them were like Windows embedded systems, which if you've ever tried to use the, the canned built-in Metasploit module for Eternal Blue on a Windows embedded system, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> so as a stupid, you know, noob, I just basically blind fired that off and yeah i mean like all those embedded systems went offline um i think they all blue screened you know and it was as simple as doing a quick reboot but this is for a company that couldn't really afford that <laughs> so yeah that was um that was definitely like a oops moment that i've learned not to repeat again so like read the the modules and read the code that you're firing off don't just blindly throw it especially on a real engagement um and i've kind of now taken the approach where if I ever like, even if it's remote code execution and I haven't tested it fully before or used it before on the exact same type of system, I'll just write it up as a finding and get approval before proceeding. Um, you know, so if that means I can't actively exploit it uh, as part of the pin test and and you know try to escalate or pivot from there, that sucks, obviously. But it, that's that's the difference between what we do and then like what bad guys do you know like they would blindly run that stuff and not care what the consequences are must be nice <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that jokingly but um <laughs> like even even for for myself like yes testing testing tools that you use is a key part of the process is like um trying to think of like a really specific example so so like um there, there's a lot of use with um c2 frameworks um both in pen testing and in red teaming um but like one thing that you really have to worry about in red teaming is like if you run something through your c2 and it ends up like crashing your beacon you don't have a way to get it back that's a problem and so yeah like it, it's in even in this world it's important to test things too yep Yep, for sure. And for those that don't know what a C2 is, I've got videos on my channel. <laughs> it's a, a command and control. I, one of my favorites is is Covenant. Um, it's a really, really cool platform to use. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd recommend trying playing with those if you haven't already. Yeah, it's certainly... Well, free is a lot cheaper than, you know, the Cobalt Strike license, but... Um, yeah, yeah. There's... Um, I don't know. I, I've never played around with covenant um was there like anything that drew you to it in particular I, I know there's like another c2 out there called batman or something made by a guy named batman oh nice i, um, I can't remember what the name of it was i don't i don't know but covenant was cool um it's it's something that runs in windows um and i just found that the powershell launchers in particular are really really handy so if you're in an internal active directory environment where you've got a ton of windows machines um especially if you compromise you know like domain admin creds or, or credentials to an account that's got local admin access uh to a, a bunch of machines i love using um crack map exec to just blast out c2 launchers uh, Covenant C2 launchers, and I, I I love it so much, and I made a whole video on how to do that exactly. Um, and yeah, it was I don't know. That's the first one I started playing with, and it had all these features that I felt like were really helpful. Um, so I kind of just stuck with it. Yeah, um, and you know, being um, you know, with fresh eyes on the field, there's um, probably some lessons that you felt that you needed to to brush up on or like um, some skills you needed to brush up on 
Um, I, I know that was certainly the case with, with me and Cloud and Active Directory. Um, what about for you? Yeah, so I mean, I guess my background had more Cloud and Active Directory just because I, I had a, a path that, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's different. I think a lot of people pivot from IT to, to pin testing. Um, so I just had the benefit of coming from the IT admin, um, sorry, the IT admin background. So that way I kind of knew a little bit about that stuff. But for me, my, my struggle was in web app security. That's why I haven't been on a ton of web app pin tests is because that's ground that is still very new to me. Um, and so I've been trying to learn a lot through like Port Swigger Web Academy and Pintester Labs. Both are awesome resources if you're trying to learn web app security. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of like where I realized early on looking at a web app, I'm like, I don't really know how to start. <laughs> so that's where I've kind of focused my learning. Yeah, it's um, web has always kind of been, um, I wouldn't say like a hobby but um, yeah, you know, I, I've messed enough around in in web that I, I feel comfortable with, just about any like, built web app that that I come across, like whether it's like even something strange like Java. Um, you know, you, usually I can fumble my way around through it. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely the the cloud side was was new for me. So I, I used to be a network engineer, and it, it was like a very like traditional kind of network engineering like routers switches that kind of stuff and the field has like almost totally changed in the last five years yeah but um yeah in, what um what about uh your your career path from like um when you first started when you first got interested in the field um what was like the 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 job path to to how you got into pen testing yeah, yeah, good question. Hey, Jason, I see you in the chat. What's up, man? Hey, D Day Cyber Wolf, or what? How do you say your name? Day Cyber Walks? Anyway, what's up, guys? Um, yeah, so my career path, it happened. So I wanted to be a pin tester. I knew, like, when I was 14, I wanted to be a pin tester because I was playing a game online. Um, some dude hit me up and was like, you know, hey, let, let's add me in Skype. Let's go do this thing. So, long story short, he adds me in Skype. And he, and he drops a phishing link into the chat um, and, you know, tries to get me to sign into it. And I'm 14. I've never seen a phishing link in my life. Um, you know, and this was like 10 years ago. So phishing wasn't quite as prevalent as it is today. Um, but I noticed some things were off, like the, the year and the, and the copyright foot, like the copyright year and the footer was outdated. There was like a broken image. The URL said .tk instead of .com. Um, so I just noticed a few things and I knew it wasn't real but I was immediately hooked. Like I had to, under, I was like, this can't be possible. You can't just clone a website. So I had to like understand how it worked, you know? So I spent the next two weeks just trying to understand phishing websites and how to create them and how to host them. And I didn't even know what a domain name was at the time. Um, so when I found out that a school in town had a cybersecurity degree program, it was like one of the first ones available. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna hop all over that. Um, maybe it'll help me understand what I'm actually doing. So I went through school. I got a two-year degree in cybersecurity and networking. While I was in school is when I did that that um, assessment against my gym. It was like a wireless assessment. That was a lot of fun. And if you're an aspiring pin tester and you don't know where to start and you don't know how to how to get going, just start talking to some of the companies you already are involved with that might know you, like a gym, for example. Like if you go there all the time and you know the owner just sit down with him, tell him about a, a recent breach that happened at a company that's similar to his, scare him a little bit, and then say, hey, look, you know, I'm studying for this. Uh, I'm looking for an in, like an internship. Would you mind if I do this assessment? I'll give you a report. Not going to cost you anything, right? Like those are things you could do. And that's what I did. And so I did that. Uh, I was a part of the cyber organ organization, like I talked about earlier. And then when I got out of school, I just started working in the field of IT. And it kind of started as like a help desk position, but quickly evolved to network administration, systems administration. Before long, I was overseeing like our entire service delivery for IT services. That's all we did. But I was like the head guy for that. Um, and so I, I became more of like a manager and I was managing a, a help desk team and doing all kinds of projects. And the entire time I was sprinkling security in, like I tried to push for new security things like um, security awareness training programs and um, trying to see if we could do more 
type of like pin test assessments for our clients, but it wasn't my, my day job. That wasn't what they hired me to do. So I had to go home and study more and try to understand those things outside of work. And I went to DEF CON in 2019, and it was a phenomenal experience. Um, it's a security conference in Las Vegas that I would highly recommend anybody who likes this stuff to go to. Um, and it just kind of made me realize, like, this is the community I want to be a part of. These are people these that are my age that work in pen testing. They know how to hack stuff, but I don't, and I want to. <laughs> so it just made me realize, like, if I'm ever going to do it, it's going to be up to me. So I got back home and I just started looking out at what resources are out there. And I came across uh, Heath Adams, a cyber mentor, um, and all kinds of other just online content that was available. And I just started soaking it all in. And I just took the leap and I signed up for OSCP and started studying in that course and um, started getting involved. I, I joined Reddit groups and started talking to people. I joined Discord servers and Slack channels and just started talking with people. I went to meetup.com and I searched for like any of the security meetups that were going on. And I found Portland's got a couple of them. And I started going to those every month. We would just meet up at a pub someplace, drink beer and talk about security. And it was awesome. Who um, doesn't want to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And And I wasn't working in it. I was an IT admin really. And so going in there and, and hearing people that were pen testers telling me about their job. And I just asked them questions. I was like, how did you do it? What do you study? I'm doing this. What do you think of that? Like, you know what I mean? And I made connections on LinkedIn. I made connections on Twitter and I just kept doing that. And then out of those connections I made, I started talking with companies. Um, you know, they were, I would ask those people, Hey, do you know if, if your company's hiring or do you know someone I could talk to? And I think over the course of 2020, I probably interviewed with at least a dozen different companies, or I would say six to at least a half dozen companies, and then a dozen recruiters who probably also helped spread my name around. Um, so it got to the point where interviews were really easy because I knew the questions that they were going to ask. Um, and, you know, it, it just made it to where when I actually came across a real opportunity that I really, really wanted to get, my nerves were kind of gone. I had done it a bunch. I knew how to answer those questions. I knew what they were looking for because at the end of each interview, I asked like, what can I do to make me a better candidate in the future? Because I knew I wasn't ready. Um, and, and they told me and I did those things like starting an online blog, um, starting to do hack the box write ups and giving back to the community, doing YouTube, right? Just making additional connections. And over time, I mean, it felt like for at least a, a straight year, nothing was happening right it just felt like i'm grinding away i'm not i'm not getting anything out of this um but then you know out of nowhere it felt like a huge landfall and i had like four different opportunities fall in my lap that we were like now you get a pick <laughs> where, where do you want to go um and so it's really cool i think to to try to actually you know i don't know i think just networking and and not forgetting why you're doing this and not giving up are probably the, the most important and hopefully lessons that you take away from my story as to how I did it. I would totally agree. Um, you know, kind of similar to you when I was a teenager. Um, you know, I, I actually had like a complete, completely different plan. But, um, you know, it, once once I kind of discovered the world of hacking, then I was like, I, I want to do this for work someday. And yeah. It, it was not an easy journey for me at all. And I don't think it's an easy journey for anyone, but um, definitely I think the, the most important thing that really carried me through all of that was, you know, staying, like sticking to the goal, you know, like bad stuff's going to happen. Like there's going to be setbacks. Um, but, you know, if, if you can really like keep your focus and stay determined on, on what you want, you can, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's true with anything. Um, and I am, you know, I've got a ton to learn and I think everyone does. And I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but the little bit that I know about the little things where I can give back and help other people, like that's what I like to do. Um, and I think it's important to, to play to those strengths too, you know. Looking back, um, is there anything that you would have done differently? 
um, to, to maybe like better hedge your, your bets uh, toward, toward getting into the field earlier? I don't know. Um, I kind of think everything for me happened the way it should have. Like, I would say when I got out of school, I wish I started studying for the OSCP sooner and, and doing all those things I just described back then. Um, you know, I think maybe I could have gotten into pin testing sooner, but that the four years I spent at that MSP, I think were extremely valuable. Like, because of that experience, I understand I understand the technology so much better than I would have if I was just trying to break into it right off the bat. You know, I learned a lot about how Active Directory and those type of domains work. Um, and I learned a, a lot about how IT admins think. And so those experiences I think are really, really valuable. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. Like, I kind of, I do feel like it kind of went the way that it should have for me. Yeah, and in, in a weird way, I kind of feel the same. Um having gone through the air force primarily for like mo most of my previous experience it's um there there was a lot that went with it that i wouldn't have traded for anything else but i you know it, it's kind of like that that old dichotomy you know like um should i go to college should i not um, yeah I, I don't necessarily think it matters which way you choose anymore but um it if you decide to go military, it will definitely set you back and not, not in like the, the ways you might think. I know I, I've heard, you know, in that last interview you did, um, he had a military background as well. And you both kind of agreed that it probably wasn't the best move. Um, which is interesting too, because for a lot of people like me that don't have any military background, um, when I hear about how if you had gone to the military and you could get all your school paid for, and like it sounds like it would be really beneficial, um, and maybe that was the path I should have taken. Um, yeah, it you sounds know. like the golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate <laughs> factory. It sounds it like the best deal on earth, but <laughs> yeah, there's a yeah there's a lot of a lot of a lot of other things involved with it. But for those that ask the question that you know is like, how do I get started? Do I go through school? Um, I, I only have an associate's degree and I pulled it off, but um, I will admit on auto, a lot of the companies I talked with wouldn't even, like as soon as they found out I didn't have a bachelor's degree, they were saying like, that's a hard thing for us. Like go back to school, get a bachelor's degree and, and come back and talk to us. Um, but then there's a lot of other companies that couldn't care less. And they're like, I don't care. What can you do? You know? And so I think, if you have aspirations to work for a particular company, you know, like if you look out there and you're like, man, I really like how this pin testing company does things, finding out what their requirements are, they might have a requirement where, you no, know, you have to have a bachelor's degree. And I don't mean look at the job posting and, oh, it says I have to have a bachelor's degree. Like go out and talk to them, reach out to someone, hit them up on LinkedIn, call the main line if you have to, like figure out someone who works there and ask them, is this a hard requirement? And if it is, you have to weigh that decision, like how bad do you want to work there? Um, but I think in most cases, you'll find that it's not as long as you can prove that you can do other things. And certifications are an easy way to do that. You know, I, I don't have any certifications currently. I failed my OSCP twice, um, but I, I'm going for my third OSCP attempt in two weeks, and hopefully it'll be my last OSCP attempt. Um, uh, but I don't think certifications are also necessary, but the value that you gain from learning the courses that those certifications put you through is a hundred percent necessary. And the relationships you build during that time is a hundred percent necessary. My first job I got because of the OSCP, not because I had the certification, but because I was going through that process, um, I would browse the OSCP subreddit constantly and I would help others that had questions or and I'd post my own questions and because I was doing that one night someone posted in there saying hey we're looking for an intern and I jumped on it and I would have never had that opportunity had um you know had I not taken the OSCP route so were there um any other uh like really interesting things that surprised you during during the uh, the job hiring process or like the job search process like things that you learned from it that you feel other people could could benefit from. I think I think the important thing is to 
make sure that you stand out. Like, I, I mean, I think that that goes with any type of job. Um, but if you can do small things that most other people aren't doing, then it's going to help you a lot. Even if you don't know how to be a pen tester yet, you know, like as long as you can communicate that I don't know these things, but I'm learning them and I will know them and I just need someone to give me an opportunity. Um, I, I think that that's all that you, you can do, you know, and, and a lot of companies are going to say, no, we really need someone who can hit the ground running. Um, but once you get your foot in the door someplace and you get a little bit of experience, I, I think it's going to be much easier to, to move around, you know, and, and find other companies that'll bring you in. Um, but as far as like things I was shocked about during the hiring process, the, the bachelor degree thing being such a hard requirement for some people, I was kind of shocked about that. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really think, I can't recall any things that were like super shocking for me, but I also just did so many that I kind of, <laughs> I kind of now know what they, what they're going to ask. So if you're watching this and you want to, to connect with me, whether it's, you know, hit me up on Twitter, hit me up on discord or whatever, or on YouTube, leave a comment. I don't care. Just reach out to me. I'll find you. Um, and I'm happy to sit with you and, and share like the type of questions they asked me and like what I did to try to prepare for the interviews. Like if I can give back and help you get in this field, I I'm happy to do it. Yep. And you know, it's really important that we have people that are willing to do that. Cause you know, um, like there's, there's a, like, you definitely need like a, a sort of work life balance, but I mean like, um, at least, in in my opinion, I, I think the the people that really want to be in this field probably also do this like in their in their free time and networking yeah. is a big part of it too. So yeah, it's, it, it's no. really really um, noble, as a matter of fact, for for you to take the time out of your day to do that on top of all of the other things that you do. I, I mean, I I just know that if I had had someone to do that for me, it would have been so much easier, you know, and I'm at a position in my life where I've got free time and I, I can help. Um, plus I just love talking about this stuff. Like I could talk about it forever. So if I can find others that also like talking about it, you know, friendships are cool. So I like to make them. Yeah. And, um, so with, with that being said, um, you know, it, it's, it's really important to have someone that, you look up to and likewise be, be, so, be someone that other people look up to. But, you know, even, even beyond that, like nobody has all of the answers and it's really, really important to take in as many different perspectives as you can, which is why I love talking to people, um, uh, on my channel. Like, um, I think I told you before, I, like, I, I don't particularly plan on, like, just solely doing interviews, but I mean, like, right. I definitely enjoy hearing hearing people's lives and their perspectives and, you know, how they got into into pen testing, because most of the time it's, like, completely different from, from my own experience. And yeah. even even beyond that, like, sometimes when, when you do something for so long, you just kind of get, like, tunnel visioned. and You don't really, like, see everything else that's going on. Yeah. And so like, um, in that direction, um, what are, what are some things that you think are going to be challenging to either pen testers or like the field of pen testing in general over the coming years? And that could be anything like, um, Terminator invasion, um, <laughs> automation, you know, automation is a big one. I hear people kind of, um, you know, get a little anxious about that one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm still, I'm still new to the field. So I haven't been able to see like automate because automation has been a thing that's, that's been progressively, you know, taken over. Um, and I haven't been able to see that progression. So it's hard for me to say like what I, what I kind of foresee as coming in the future. But I do think that, especially in the concept, like the, the conversation of automation, it's a, it's a tool more than anything else. And like when you start thinking about um, like web application security and, and, and like business logic flaws that a vulnerability scanner isn't going to be able to find, you know, I think that no matter what, even if AI gets super advanced, like there's never going to be the need to like, there's never going to eliminate the need for, for people like us to go in and test these things because we, our whole jobs are testing 
technology. Like that's, that's what we do. We test technology and automation is technology. Someone needs to test that to make sure it's secure. Someone needs to test that uh, to make sure it doesn't miss anything, right? So there's never going to be like the elimination of, of a penetration tester, I don't think. It might change, like the type of work we do is going to evolve, uh, no questions asked. Just like it's changed from how it was 10 years ago. For You know, if you hear and watch interviews from people that worked in the field that long, the stuff they do today is way different than the stuff they used to do. Um, you know, and so we've got to continue to evolve, but that's, that's just true in, in technology as a whole. Yeah. What are some exciting things that, that you see coming to, to the field? Likewise, I'm excited to see where automation goes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if we can get automation to, to remove and eliminate some of our, our stupid tasks that we see us ourselves doing every day, um, you know, then we can focus and dive in on the more advanced stuff. So I think that that's going to be cool. Um, you know, I, I'm excited personally just to learn more about how pin testing works today, you know, and, and being so new to the field, uh, there's a lot that I still haven't seen. And so to me, every day is extremely exciting because I'm already seeing new stuff and I'm already learning new things. Um, and that's the type of thing like if you enjoy technology and you enjoy every day being something new this is this is a great opportunity you know to to try to dive into because you're never going to get bored <laughs> you, yeah. you might get bored because you're doing the same type of assessments every day um but you can always research new ways to do those assessments yeah i think with the uh with the advent of deep learning in recent times, I think the way that we conduct phishing engagements is going to be dramatically changed in yeah. the very near future. Because like um, deep deep fakes is, is getting oh. better all the time. Um, there's uh, natural language processing that's getting better all the time. Like eventually, it will get to the point where like you might be able to artificially like recreate the CEO of, of your target company and be like, Hey, um, how about you just, uh, give me remote access to, to the external yeah. servers. Right. And that's, that's huge, man. That's really, really huge to, to think about. Cause if you look at just regular vishing today, like it's very successful on that engagement. I was telling you about out of the people we got to connect, like actually answer the phone, 60% of them that answered, we were able to successfully fish. And that was either get them to give us their password to their email account and accept the MFA prompt when we went to sign in, um, or talk them into going to a website, signing into that website and pulling their credentials that way. Um, and most people, like if you have a friendly voice and, and you know, you don't have it, like if, if you sound like someone that's local to them and, and you're nice, and you have a convincing enough pretext, they'll believe you. So I could only imagine when when deep fakes get to that point where it's easily accessible for anybody to to do what you just described. <laughs> I'm kind of worried to live in that world, to be honest with you. Yeah, like um, um, it definitely sounds exciting, you know, for for us and you know doing the job. But I mean, you know, when the technology evolves to the point where where an artificially created you know personality is almost indistinguishable from from the real yeah. one I, I don't I, I don't even know if the world's prepared for that because i mean i'm already i'm already scared like when i do pin tests and i see brands that i recognize you know um doing really bad things as far as like managing their security or managing customer data that I might even be a customer of, I get worried. I'm like, you know, like, how do we help these people understand, understand this better? Um, and how do we prevent this from, from being such a problem? So yeah, when you talk about stuff like that, that's, that's really like, it, it'll keep me up at night. <laughs> and, and, but because of that, like, we've got to find solutions to those issues. And I think what it comes down to for that is, training and, and ways to use technology to try to detect them. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, even, um, kind of, kind of in a different context, but weirdly kind of similar. Um, you remember the big, um, Twitter breach from yeah. a couple of months ago? Oh yeah. I mean, like, 
even even if we were to you know if we had the capability to to like verify or authenticate somebody in real life you know with with like a like a like a blue check mark i mean it might not it, like you might not even know like th there's there's just yeah. so much weird things coming um and i really don't know what the future is going to look like but as far as security is concerned i'm certain we're going to still have jobs it's just i'm there there's no question about it, you know, and, and when you start talking about, um, like you had a conversation about, I think it was like virtual augmentation and virtual reality. Um, you know, and that, that's a really interesting topic too. And maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's how we can do the, the verified human check blue check mark is if you're wearing like glasses and you look at someone, it can, it can do some sort of check that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's never going to be like, Here's the thing. Technology has always been ahead of security. People in security have been playing catch up the entire time. And because of that reason, technology is going to keep moving ahead and security is still going to, it's never going to catch up. And I think in some ways, technology is going to like continue to, to just accelerate because there's new people who have new ideas and they're smart and they know how to develop stuff. And that's where they spend their time is developing new stuff. Um, but there's not as many of those people in the security world that take the time to, to say, okay, well, did you write that new stuff securely? And, and there's always new ways to break into it too. So yeah, I don't think that that's going to be an issue at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of developing new things, uh, I've, I've heard you talk about um, a, a tool that you're very excited about. Is, uh, is there any, <laughs> any secrets that you can share with us or? You're talking about the one that I was developing. Uh -huh. So I'm not a developer. We'll, we'll start by saying that just point blank. Um, I've written a couple PowerShell scripts in my, in my like IT admin job to help automate tasks like onboarding new users, connecting to Office 365, um, and then, you know, like documenting everything in our documentation system. I've written PowerShell scripts to do that. Um, and when I was on an engagement where I compromised an Office 365 account, there was a lot of stuff that I did in PowerShell, like as part of my enumeration process. So I started thinking like, all right, well, if I'm manually doing all these PowerShell commands, why don't I just write a script that can do it for me? So if you, if you are, uh, if you've got a programming background and you want to help me clean up some code, cause again, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a developer. I've got like this weird tool that will help automate or I guess like enumerate an Office 365 account um, and it'll do a lot of cool things. So reach out to me. I don't want to share too much in case someone else tries to clone my idea, but um, yeah, I think that that's something that I might try to release in the next, I don't know, month or so if I get, if I feel confident enough that people aren't going to tear apart my code. That's kind of where I'm at is I don't want to put it on the internet for people to be like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> uh, I'm kind of feeling like the, uh, like the, Lord of the Rings meme right now, you know, with Frodo being like, okay, keep your secrets. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, very cool. It's, it's exciting. And, you know, like, um, there are some very good, like kind of cloud-based kind of, um, I guess content or, or there's not really like, like a, like a platform, if you will, to, to really dig deep into, into O365 enumeration and yeah. exploitation like there's there's content out there but there's nothing like really well put together well yeah and that's why i don't want to release my thing because it's not well put together <laughs> but but it's a it's a hole in the market that i think could be really really cool um and you know like i'm not interested in making money off of it i just want to make sure it's a quality thing that i throw out there um so yeah like that's i and i think it's helpful for people like us you know that when we were doing that that campaign, uh, the vision campaign, within an hour we had like a dozen credentials, and each one of them can take forever if you're like fine to like you know if you're like going through each one of each one of those accounts and trying to pull details out of emails or pull details out of OneDrive files or looking at SharePoint documents. Like it can take a really long time to browse through all that stuff manually. So if there was a platform that could help a not like audit automate the process and pull out all of the juicy stuff. I think that would help a lot of people 
a lot of pin testers. It could probably be used, obviously, for bad, but that's kind of that's kind of the world we live in. Um, you know, anything, I guess, any of the pin testing tools can always be used for bad. Yeah, and I mean, like, um, there's certainly a lot of stuff out there, like especially for AWS, but um, like with, with Azure and O365, like it's it seems kind of weird because like it felt like it came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like. One one year it was all just like everything's local. Everybody has like their their own mail servers and their own their own yeah. domains. Like now and then, like the next day, it was like, hey, boom, Azure and all of the cloud is here. Surprise! So yeah, I mean, I, I I'm I'm only 24. I've been only been working in IT for four or five years. Um, but my my boss that I worked with at that MSP he basically tried to brand like us as like a cloud service provider at first. Um, and he was like really pushing stuff moving to the cloud. This was like 2010 era, right? 2010 to 2014 or so where it was all still very new and a, and a big buzzword. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's rare now to come, especially when it comes to email, it's rare to come across a, an on-prem exchange server from my experience. Yeah. I think everybody's in office 365 or Google, you know, um, and personally, I think there's a lot of reasons to go to Office 365 for, for email. And then if you're there for email, you know, you might as well put everything else in Azure or Azure, whatever you pronounce it as. But, um, yeah, it's, it did seem like it kind of came quick. Um, and that's why security is always going to have, a, I guess, like if you're a security professional, you're always going to have a job because there's going to be people that rush to move things to the cloud or move things to the next big thing um, before anyone even really understands it. So there's going to be a ton of security holes. Yeah. And, um, you know, if there's any key trait that I would recommend anybody to develop, it's the ability to rapidly adapt because this yeah. field changes literally every day, sometimes yep. multiple times a day. Yep, for sure. Wayne, by the way, I see you in the chat asking some really awesome, like, Windows administration type questions. Um, one of them he asked here, does Windows Server have tools to detect attacks like Kerberos Um He works in a, a Windows domain environment. So just to answer that as if, like, I would if I was consulting with somebody, Kerberos is really tough to, to eliminate. Um, it's an attack that the best mitigation strategy is to have really strong like Windows credentials. So like on those service accounts, make sure that you just have really, really strong passwords that are not going to be break, like broken. Um, and that's going to be your best mitigation strategy. Um, and then the second step would be being able to set up um, alerting for when a Kerberos attack takes place. And you can do that by, if you have like an RMM tool, or some way to to monitor the event viewer. Obviously, trying to comb through event logs and pulling out those event IDs aren't going to work. But if you can set up some sort of alerting system, so when that event ID gets logged, you get a notification. That's going to be the next best step because then you'll know when a Kerberos attack took took place, and you can go and reset those passwords so the captured credentials will, won't be valid anymore. So. Cool. Yeah, and um, if your organization has money, um, Microsoft offers a service. At, it's called ATA, but I can't remember what it stands for. I think it's um, Advanced Threat Analytics or something like that. And so they will do all of that for you. Um, so like, it's kind of like Minority Report, right? They have like three kidnapped children in a basement, and they're all like tied together by the brain stems. And they, they just like watch all of all of the, like the the Active Directory attacks. Like it's really deep and really powerful, but um, I, I think it's really expensive too. But um, Microsoft ATA is something to check out if your organization can afford it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that's the thing that also sucks about security is it's expensive, and you know that's what we were talking about in the beginning about just trying to make it more affordable. Um, and I think that that's something that we kind of need to move as a as a whole <laughs> community towards some way or another, but yeah, but um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to you know take questions with you if um if your if your viewers have anything. I'm uh, I, th I think I covered all of the ones that I wanted to. Cool. Yeah. The only other thing was also something that Wayne had mentioned. Um, he said that he's dealt with transitive net logon service attacks against our domain during the past year. 
and poor firewall configs were the cause. I don't think it was a question. He was just kind of sharing some of his background. I do think it would be really cool. This isn't my idea. Um, this was my my boss's idea for the pen testing company I work with now. Um, to start like a a podcast type thing where it's like kind of like this. We just have a conversation, but then you have people that call in, like people like Wayne who call in and they ask questions and you know almost like a a regular show where people can call in and get consultations for free um and i think that that could be a huge way that we we do make security more accessible for companies um you know because otherwise the only other way to like get one of us on a phone call uh is hopefully you'll catch him in a live stream to ask a question or to pay for a pen test and that just may not be reality for some people yeah and um you know speaking of resources uh, like i don't want to shut this down without talking about resources um <laughs> what, what were some that have helped you in your journey so far to become an ethical hacker yeah yeah um i've got all kinds of shout outs <laughs> that, that i can throw most of my learning has been free available content on the internet um i i made a video that kind of talked about how i became a hacker in, in 2020 um, so that kind of goes over everything I'm about to share, but it's networking, finding any events that you can, finding Reddit groups, finding Discord channels. Um, those are going to be awesome resources where you can just really get personal with people. Um, and then YouTube, YouTube is huge. There's all kinds of content creators. We've got Cody Winkler. He's a great guy. Uh, we've got this dude named Jason Sec, who was in the chat earlier. I really like his stuff. He does YouTube videos of all kinds of things, but he also has quite a bit of reviews where he talks about uh, some of the other resources I'll name drop, like Pintester Labs or Burp Suite Academy uh, or the OSCP exams, different certification paths he does reviews on. Um, so, and he's a smaller channel, so give him some love. Um, and then of course the Cyber Mentor, I think anybody would drop his name as a, as a go-to beginner friendly guy. Uh, he's a pretty well-known dude, Ipsec. Oh my God, I can't watch a single IPSEC video without taking away at least like three new things. Uh, ma like <laughs> majority of the content that I produce on my blog is just something I've copied straight from his video because I learned this new thing and I'm like, I'm not gonna remember this, but I need to. So I'll go write a, a, a blog post about it. Um, you know, he's, he's insane, the stuff that he can do. Uh, he just does like hack the box write-ups if you haven't watched his stuff before. Uh, really cool guy. And then, I mean, there's all kinds of people that I'm sure I'm forgetting. There's a dude named Conda. He just started releasing like ethical hacking content. Um, he's newer to the community too. Um, and he's got a Discord channel that I'm a part of. It's got like 60 members currently. And there's some really, really cool people in there. I'd highly recommend joining that. Um, so yeah. Uh, hopefully, you know, if you're watching this and you're like, man, you didn't name me, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people, but you have resources in mind that, that you would like to kind of give a shout out to? Um, you know, uh, most most of the ones that have been helpful for me have been the hands-on ones. So um, way back in the day, um, it was smashthestack.org. They had like um, very much like um, like over the wire style yeah. challenges, um, kind of war games, if you will. Um, that was a very different time, and there wasn't <laughs> nearly as many resources available. So, like, if you got stuck yeah. on something, you know, you couldn't just... I mean, they do, they did have forums, but, like, you couldn't just go on there and be like, hey, can I get a nudge? Because, like, they just, like, give you, like, this PhD, like, thesis write-up. Right either about the subject in general and you wouldn't understand any of it, or they'd tell you to, you know, F off and yeah. like, go, go read, go read something. Um, but, um, yeah. So like, uh, these days what I think is doing really good is, um, try hack me for sure. Cause like, um, I know it, it might've been the same way for you, but I know when I started, like it, it was very difficult to pick up the material at first because like, there wasn't like a whole lot of examples. And yeah. um, so like, even, even if you did come across something, it was like for a very specific context. Yeah. But um, I, I think try hack me is doing amazing things. Cybersec labs is another one that I've heard great things about, but um, I mean, even hack the box, like I, I think some of the ratings on, on their active machines are a little skewed. Um, sure. 
but um but overall they do offer a great service and i think um the most important thing that people can do to to get better is to actually do it but yeah. um i i understand there there's a huge learning curve like especially especially you know with all of the new technologies coming out if i was a beginner starting over again um I would start with the Cyber Mentors, either his his ten dollar Udemy course. He now actually has TCM Academy. It's his own website. Haven't checked it out, um, but it's supposed to be the same course at I think a price that he completely profits from. So if you want to support him, that'd be the better way to buy it. Um, but he's got a practical ethical hacking course that teaches literally like beginner stuff, like really really basic how to use in-map type stuff. Um, so I'd highly recommend starting there. And he also then uses hack the box examples for really beginner boxes. I get, I agree with you. I wouldn't trust the ratings when you're looking on hack the box and, you know, people can pick the ratings or whatever. I wouldn't trust that as like your gauge of difficulty, but if you look at the, the cyber mentor stuff, he really finds the beginner boxes and he shows you exactly how to enumerate them and how to exploit them, um, step by step. And once you go through that, if you also didn't want to pay for it, he's got all kinds of free stuff on his YouTube channel, like hacking for noobs, I think, or hacking for beginners, something like that, um, where it's the same stuff. It's going through hack the box and and doing that. But once you get past that level, I would start watching Ipsec. You're not going to understand him. You're not going to like you're going to watch that and you're going to be very intimidated and you're going to think like, I don't know this at all. I don't know what's going on. Um, don't give up. Keep watching Ipsec and just mimic what he's doing and start with some of his older stuff if you need to because i think he explains it a little bit more in the older stuff than he does now in the newer stuff um but that's where i would start you know as far as like practical hands-on i haven't used try hack me um i've looked at it and i've never really it felt too i don't know it felt too gamey for me i really like hack the box where it's like you spin up a, a, a machine you connect to a vpn and you just hack at it like that's really practical to me. That's like exactly what you would see in a, a pen test. And that's exactly what you would see on the OSCP exam. So I like that. Um, but I've heard try hack me is a great resource for like hand holding, like step by step. This is yes. what you do. So if you're a beginner, I can see that being a lot of use, like really useful. Um, yeah. As, I don't know. As far as difficulty on try hack me goes their their hardest boxes are like below easy level on hack the box like the, <laughs> yeah so i mean but i mean it serves it serves a like a, a great demographic you know because like there's a lot of people you you'll see them all over the place reddit um you know a variety of different forums discords they'll be like hey i don't really understand this topic you know what what can i do and yeah you know i i wholeheartedly believe like if you're brand spanking new to the field try hack me is going to be a good place for you yeah. Yeah. And, and I think if, if you need someone to talk to personally for like a, I've really wanted to do this, but I've got all these doubts or I don't think it's for me or I'm too scared. I'm not good enough or whatever. Right. Reach out to, to me for sure. I'm sure Cody would be offering the same exact thing. Um, and if we needed to chat on Twitter, if we needed to chat like on a discord call or whatever the case is like, that was really helpful for me. I paid the cyber mentor. I paid him like for an hour of his time to take the leap. Like I was really worried about leaving my sysadmin job. And I was really worried about like all these self doubts I had of getting started. Um, I wasn't good enough to start OSCP, you know, but I got back from DEF CON and I wanted to. So I called him um, and we spoke for an hour and he, by the end of that call, I got off of it and I literally immediately went to uh, offensive security and paid out of pocket to start my OSCP course. Um, you know, and so sometimes you just need that push from somebody in the field who's done it before um, to just tell you like, get over yourself and just do it. And, and I'm glad, I'm glad that I had that experience. So if you need someone like that, we're here to help. Yep. And, you know, that, that's exactly why I like having, you know, discussions like this, because I know almost nobody does it. You know, nobody, yeah. nobody's I mean, there there's a there's a couple of people out there like um, Lisa Forte on on Twitter. Like she she's out there always, always talking to people about, you know, people's career paths and what they're doing. But I mean, like overall, it's it's really not that widely talked about. So like when someone comes up and they're like, hey, how do I get into 
the field of ethical hacking. Right. Everybody's got their own answer, and it's yeah. like spread out all over the place. It's really like really difficult to find. So that's one reason that I like having these discussions is so that one like piques my curiosity I'm, I'm not gonna lie but on on the other hand like people might find themselves in in their own circumstances and you know they can come and you know hear discussions with people like you and they'll be like oh well that that's not a bad idea why don't why don't i try working at an msp you know? yeah yep yep just mim mimicking the success like if you find someone who's doing what you want to do do what they did <laughs> it's really it's really simple do what they did and you'll get there um and obviously everyone's journey is going to be a little different and luck is going to be sprinkled in along the way um but don't yeah. wait eight years between exam attempts like me <laughs> i mean that, it's kind of similar i didn't wait eight years but um my first exam attempt i took in march uh for the oscp i didn't take my second one until september or october it was october you know, that's a pretty big gap. Um, I will admit the second time around, it was so much easier than the first time around. And, you know, I continued to study and learn, but there was a, a period where it, like a lot of self-doubt kicked in. It's like, am I going to be able to do this? And, you know, motivation and stuff kind of shifted. Um, but I didn't make that same mistake this time. Uh, you know, I, I took my last attempt in October. I have a two month, two month cool down and then I'm going at it again here in December. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes this time around. Yeah, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, you know, I remember my first attempt. I was, um, like I said, I, I, kind of, I kind of felt like, like I was okay at the time. Um, but, you know, significant reporting mistakes is, is ultimately what did me in. That and not paying attention. But, um, you know, af after preparing for so long, you know, my, my second attempt, it was like Michael Jordan playing against, like, fifth grade basketball <laughs> players like it, it was just ridiculous so like yeah. um i think probably one of the biggest things that helped me along the way was just building my own labs and building my own scenarios because like um like you can go into hack the box and you could go into like all of these challenge sites and, and you can do them and it's fine but you know it when you build your own and you know make them like as weird and intricate as you can like I, I mean you can even get like a pretty cheap azure subscription these days but um so like what i did was i, I would build um networks via gns3 and then i would tie in vms um with uh virtual box and nice. so it, it was almost like a like a small actual network and yeah. you know, it allowed me to to learn pivoting really really well like that and so like um you know, even just doing simple things like that can can really, really hunker down on on a on a topic that you may or may not have problems with. And I think that's your IT background shining through a little bit because in IT it's super huge uh, to make home labs. You know, like that's it, that's not a security thing as much. Like you don't really hear that as much in the security community because there's all these like hack the box phone hub, right? There's all those resources. Um, but for almost any regular IT type role. Um, it, it's that's definitely an interview question I would ask when I was a hiring manager and be like, so what does your home lab look like? <laughs> if they didn't have a good answer, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't a good, it wasn't always the best fit for, for the role. Um, you know, so making active directory environments or whatever uh, on what just out of VMs on your, on your home system, or maybe you have like a different server set aside is, is definitely big in the IT world of regular IT stuff. Yeah, and you can build all sorts of interesting scenarios too. Like I, I think one of the the favorite ones that I made, um, it was kind of like a like a quirky like um, RoboCop remake. So like all of the domain characters were characters from RoboCop, and nice. the the domain admi administrator was the main bad guy. Nice. Jones. So yeah, uh, and even even then, like once you pivot through, like there was a back end host running a. a it was a SCADA suite by a company called um, Snyder Electric. And yep. the application is called IGSS, which is like um, their their main like ICS platform that they make. And so like 
I mean, it, it wasn't like a real thing, like a, a real network that you would see in real life. But, you know, just going through and then at the end of the day, you get to like turn a bunch of valves, like max them out to the red, like make a w- pretend like water pump explode. Like, dude, nice. dude, if you could build like crazy situations like that, like it's fun at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's super fun. I mean, I've the the home lab stuff that I've done, I've got. I just use Oracle box too. Like you don't have to get crazy with it. Um, you know, if, don't get it. Don't get intimidated by it. You know, you can use an Oracle box. You could spin up a windows server. You can spin up some windows 10 hosts and connect them, configure your own uh, little VLAN and configure your own subnet with all those machines. And that's what I've done on a lot of the YouTube videos that I make. I, I just, I created my own domain I, and I used the NBA as a theme. So like LeBron James is domain admin, you know, so just like stupid stuff like that. Um, and, it, and you can have fun with it for sure. And I think that that's, that's definitely huge. Um, Cause st- hacking stuff and breaking into stuff is a lot of fun, but if you don't really understand the impact of what you just broke into, or you don't understand how to build the thing that you're hacking, you're, you're missing a big piece of it. And if you're doing consulting work, going and talking with these people who build these networks and manage them, you've got to be careful with it. Like that's their baby. You know what I mean? Like they've spent a ton of time and effort into building that. And so you going in there and you're saying, yeah, so in, in two hours we tore it apart. That doesn't always feel good f- for them. So you've got to, having that background, I think is very beneficial um, if you're going to be a consultant. And I imagine it's probably same, like similar in, in in-house pen testing roles, but yeah yeah absolutely um i think probably the biggest difference though is that the the stakes are a lot higher if you mess up you know yeah but sure but ultimately i mean you know like um there there's really three really good skills that that you can you don't even really like really need to be born with them like you can just kind of build them um so like communication probably number one um but Number two, uh, probably like getting comfortable writing reports. I, I think that kind of ties in with communication a little bit, but um, it, not necessarily. Some people can be really, really good at like talking um, and communicating with people, but they suck at putting it on paper or it looks like crap, you know? Yep. And then, <laughs> um, resilience being the third one. You got to be able to, to take the take the punches, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Um, if you watch any of Nam- Nahamsek, he's a he's a live streamer for basically he's really big in a bug bounty community. Um, that's like what he does full time, and he has a ton of interviews where he brings people that are well known in the bug bounty space in, and they have conversations. And one question he asks everybody that goes through is, "How do you deal with imposter syndrome?" And it's a huge problem in any community, probably, but definitely in ours. Um, and I have this every other week where, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) Or if you're on an engagement and you don't find anything, like you kind of start to worry, like, is this like, I'm not good enough at my job because I can't find anything, you know? And so it's like, it's, it's a problem that you've got to be able to to juggle for sure. And you've got to be resilient to keep, keep going back and trying again and trying again. So that's really cool that I'm glad that you, you threw that in. I think a lot of people don't throw that in um, when it talk, when they talk about like skills or personality traits needed to be successful in this field. Yep. Yep. Um, Resilience is probably the only reason why I'm even in this field is because, you know, just I've dealt with a lot over the last 10 years and, you know, it with, um, and I know, you know, at least um, like one personal thing of mine, but um, like, there it there's times where it can be really easy to be like, oh, screw this, I'm giving up. But um, you just gotta keep going, man. Like, yep, no matter what. Yep, for sure. And for those that are like, you know, reporting is my weakness, or communication is my weakness. If you have resiliency, <laughs> then your weakness is only temporary. You know what I mean? Like, you just have to keep trying and keep getting better um look at reports that are nice and copy theirs you know what i mean like or or communication that one's a little bit hard like if you've got social anxiety or you have some of those type of problems it can be really difficult to to communicate well um but pushing out of that comfort zone i think is important there are there you know a lot of technical people some of the like most some of the smartest people i know technically 
or awkward when it comes to like that personal communication skill. I think there's a lot of IT people who are really introverted and they don't want to talk to others. And there's a need for them in the in the industry. And there's a good fit for you if that's who you are. Um, but if you also can communicate well and you've got soft skills down, that you're you're going to have so many more opportunities, like in, incredibly more opportunities if you're both technical and can communicate well. Um, because especially in like the consulting world, that's what we do. We technically hack stuff and then we hop on debrief calls and we explain why that hack worked. And sometimes you're talking to people who don't even know how to use Excel, <laughs> yep. you know, or, or can't even spell OSCP. So it's, it's, it's important definitely to have those skills for sure. So um, I guess with um, that being said, kind of start bringing it to a close. I know we're running almost an hour 30 now, but, um, yeah. any final thoughts? Um, you know, I, I, I think the biggest single most important thing that you can do that anybody can do is reach out and talk to people like this. Yep. hundred percent agree. hundred percent. You know, if you're looking for a job, start by talking to people who have that job, find out what they did like we talked about. Um, but then also don't be afraid. I mean, I'm sure I'm probably a little annoying on LinkedIn when I'm looking, like I'll search pen tester and I'll connect with anybody who has that title and I'll add a note saying like, Hey, you know, I'm just looking to, to talk with you. And so I'm sure some people see that and they're like, leave me alone, you know, and I won't hit them more than once. Um, but I think it's important to do because you've got to, you've got to find others and you've got to talk with them and, and networking is the biggest way to, to get opportunities for sure. Yep. But, but yeah, I mean, I don't really have any other closing thoughts. I really appreciate everybody who, who, you know, took the time to watch this an hour and a half to hear two guys speak, uh, especially just some dude that's like me that doesn't really know a lot, but likes to talk about this stuff. Like that's, I, I appreciate you guys hopping on. Um, you know, if you're watching from my stream, please check out Cody's stuff. I've got a link to his channel in the description. And if you're watching on Cody's channel, um, I'm sure he would like to say something to you. Yep. Um, links will be in the description. Um, I try not to give my viewers too much attention because I have a feeling they'll get a little, a little rowdy. But... Um, <laughs> But um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll put the the links for your YouTube, your Twitch. Um, anything, anything else? No, I uh, I think that that's good for me. Um, I don't really stream on Twitch. Um, I might one day, but I think I meant to say Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. I, I meant to say Twitter. I'll I'll put the links for your YouTube and your Twitter in the yeah. in the description. But um, yeah, if you have any others, I, I'd be happy to add those too. No, that's that's perfect. From there, I can I can throw out things that might come up. Um, for those that don't know, uh, if you're new and wanting to get into the field, Humble Bundle has got like this awesome deal right now. It's like eighteen dollars for eighteen books that you can get. I don't have an affiliate link or anything. I've got nothing to gain from that. I just wanted to share because we've been talking about getting into the field, and I don't know how long that deal is going to last. So I would just Google Humble Bundle like hacking books, and you'll find that. Um, but yeah, yeah, and that's sorry. a really good deal too. Um, one of them in there is a book by George Weidman, um, "Hands-On Penetration Testing." Um, yep. That that is an incredible book, and if if you really want to like lay the foundation for for your for your career as a penetration tester, that book has almost everything you need to know. Yeah, I forgot to mention that I bought that book before I started OSCP and went through it, and it was very valuable. So definitely worth the worth the read. Yep. Well, thank you so cool. much, man. I really appreciate your time getting to know yeah, you better man. and hearing your stories. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. And I think a lot of people, you know, will, will be able to take things away and understand what, what they need to do to move forward with their lives. Well, cool, dude. I appreciate you too. And, uh, I'm, I mean, we'll, we'll stay in contact and we'll come up with other projects and hopefully if other people ever want to connect on projects, reach out to either of us. And if we've got time, um, I'm sure that, that we'd love to get involved. So yep, absolutely, thank you, man. Thank, thank you for the interview. All right. Catch you later. See ya.